Hey folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiatorius. So I'm going to talk uh, relatively briefly about larger two-handed swords or large big long swords, shall we call them that? So um, it's interesting that when we get into the, particularly the 15th century, although t there are some earlier examples and I'll talk about that in a second, but when we get into the 15th century, uh, particularly from around the middle of the 15th century, maybe a little bit, maybe 1430s, 1440s probably starting off, we start to see certain long swords get bigger in proportions. Um, this could be for various reasons, but obviously there is a, a progression, there is a tendency, um, a movement towards uh, a greater presence, a preponderance of big two-handed swords. And you can see that I'm holding uh, an example of one of those here. Now, before I carry on, just to say that yes, this is a new acquisition. This has been uh, sent to me by uh, Windless, and uh, it's very, very nice, um, actually, and I'm, I'm rather impressed by it. Um, but there will be a full review of this sword coming pretty soon, actually. But this isn't a review of this sword. It is more just to introduce you to the uh, topic. And obviously, my big old uh, Zweihander, which has been used in various videos here, this is uh, a Deltin example, a uh, Venetian two-handed sword. And that is the kind of culmination, I suppose, in some ways, of um, two-handed swords, if you want to call them, by their various names. In Germany, they're known by various terms. A lot of people use the term Zweihander, um, or I, I understand my pronunciation might not be perfect, but Zweihander in... Um, modern in modern usage and it's been used in a few uh, video games and stuff like that historically the term Zweihander I understand wasn't really used very much Bidenhander sometimes used but anyway two-handed sword uh, in uh, Spain it might be known as a montante in fact it was known as a montante uh, in Italy it was known as spadone which just means big sword and in England it was known as two-handed sword <laughs> uh, occasionally people use the word great sword I personally I oh know I have seen the term great sword used in a historical source but it was earlier and I don't think it was really referring to something like that but basically whatever we call these things Big two-handed swords sort of start to become a little bit more common in the 15th century, particularly in the second half of the 15th century, so between 1450 and 1500, 1501. And then um, in the 16th century, we start to see two-handed swords sort of coming into their own. Uh, and if you look at the treatises, the fencing treatises, that's really when we start to see uh, big two-handed swords being used uh, you know, with some degree of frequency. Not as much, they're not covered as much in the treatises as long swords are, for example. You could argue that that's maybe partly because certainly when you get with the really big swords, they're not really fencing weapons so much as battlefield weapons, and there is a tendency for the fencing treatises to focus on fencing weapons used in uh, the fencing schools, not to say that they weren't used in the fencing schools, but things like bills and halberds and partisans, these were main battlefield weapons, and these were as well, but they don't get as much attention in the fencing treatises as things like sword and buckler or longsword or rapier or whatever, Dussac. So, um, two-handed swords do become more popular second half of the 15th century and into the 16th century. And really what I want to make people aware of is that they are, they do enter into a different category. Once you make, I mean this is in form really like a big longsword. Now this windlass example is modelled on an example in the Royal Armouries in Leeds in England. Um, and I am familiar with that example but I've not personally held it. That being said, there is a very similar example in the Museum of London which I'm also familiar with. And there is a sort of similar example in the Wallace collection. Um, it's a slightly different design but, and slightly different proportions, but I have held the Wallace collection example. Now, what's interesting is, contrary to what you might expect, when you make a longsword bigger and bigger and bigger, you don't just end up with a big longsword. It sort of becomes a different weapon. And we kind of see that in the way that these are used to some degree. They're not just used like giant longswords. Because once you get over a certain size, um, there are certain motions that you might be able to do with a longsword which don't really work very well anymore, partly because of the length, partly because of the weight, um, with the two-handed sword. Um, but there are other things to do with the proportions of your body because obviously the, if I'm not going to put this on because it's a sharp one, but there we go, gently on a pad on the ground. You can see that this comes up to the centre of my chest. It's not massive. Uh, but these two-handers come up to kind of face height or even the top of your head height at maximum. 
they're obviously relative to your height. So for some people, they'll be over your head. Okay, so I'm six foot one, and that comes up to uh, pretty much the middle of, it's above my nipple height, so to speak, so the top of my sort of sternum, I guess. Um, so this is big, and this very much, although it's uh, for its size, it's quite a nimble weapon, it's comparable to pole arms, okay? It's not comparable, really, to long swords, and that's the point I want to make is that once you get over a certain size, because of the length of the distance between the hands, the length of the blade, the fact that the blade has to have a certain amount of distance to be able to clear the ground, for example, um, and its proportions relative to your body change it so it becomes more like a pole arm. Now, it's not a pole arm, of course, technically, because it doesn't have a pole. Uh, it is a, uh, you know, it is a sword. It is a giant sword. But the space in martial arts that these big two-handed swords occupy is really a, a particular one to those swords and they are treated differently and we see that again if we look at the fencing treatises the montante the Svihanda, the uh, spadone are treated as separate weapons usually there's a borderline there's a gray area in the middle there because at what point does something become stop being a big long sword and start to become a two-handed sword there's no answer to that question, but um, they are treated differently in the treatises to simply a longsword. Um, so, I have been asked in the past, can you use a big sword of this kind of proportions? Can you use it with Fiore's uh, techniques? Not really, okay? I would caveat that with saying that there are some things in Fiore or Ringek or Talhofer or whatever that you, there are some things that you can just translate directly to the big two-handed sword. And if you are, um, if you have experience at doing longsword of any level, then of course you can transfer that experience and, and adapt that experience to the use of two-handed sword. It's not a totally different thing or anything like that, but it is a different thing. It's not just simply a big long sword. It is a little bit more than that. It's a little bit separated from that. Finally, I want to talk about mass and weight. And so a lot of people are, um, I guess, used to the weights of arming swords and long swords, perhaps even rapiers and side swords and things like that. And once you start to scale something up, everything gets bigger. You're not just simply adding a bit of blade on the end, although you could do that. Um, but usually, if you've made the blade longer, usually the blade gets a bit broader, otherwise the blade would be too flexible, too wobbly. Uh, usually it has to be a little bit thicker. I actually poked the... I've got a very high ceiling here and I actually managed to poke the ceiling. doesn't matter, it's my garage, but um, that shows how long this is. Um, and this is a 44-inch blade, if I remember correctly. Um, so not only does the blade become longer, but it usually becomes wider, usually becomes thicker, and the hilt becomes correspondingly longer, and the cross guard becomes longer and therefore heavier usually a, sometimes a bit thicker. The pommel usually becomes uh, a little bit heavier, a little bit bigger. So everything, it's, it's kind of a, it's not literally exponential, but it, it kind of goes up like this on a graph. It's not simply, um, you know, it's not simply the fact that you've added a bit of blade length or a little bit of tang length. Everything else gets longer. Even the grip material increases as well. So the weights do go up. Um, and as we've talked about in the past, with the really biggest um, two-hand swords, we're often looking at, you know, whereas a long sword might weigh three to four pounds very often, sometimes a shade below that, but that's fairly unusual, and sometimes a shade above that, but let's say three to four pounds. Very often when you get into bigger two-handed swords, um, you sometimes see the weights go up to, you know, seven or eight pounds, okay? And yes, indeed, there are parade versions and people debate over how do you tell whether something is a parade sword or whether it's a, um, you know, a ceremonial sword or whether it's a, a bearing sword, and I'll come back to that in a second, or whether it's just simply, uh, or whether it is a fighting sword. And often you can't tell because they're the same swords. Um, but they just make especially big ones for ceremonial purposes, we think. But maybe we're, maybe that's our poor interpretation. Maybe, in fact, those were intended to be used. Who knows? Um, but you do occasionally see those. There's one in the Wallace collection, which, if I remember correctly, is something ludicrous, like about 13 or 14 pounds in weight, which is really heavy uh, for a sword. Um, so contrary to you know what you might see in role-playing game guides or on video games or whatever, Long swords, a typical long sword, weighs three or four pounds. Um, a two-handed sword usually weighs, 
above that, um, but say five, six, seven, up to about eight pounds. Okay, that's the usual kind of range. What do these weigh? Well, we've looked at these before. That, that weighs, I think, uh, about seven and a half pounds, if I remember correctly. This one weighs actually under five pounds, although it is pretty big. If I just compare it quickly, you can see it's not far off the size of the uh, Zwei Hander, but it's uh, more tapered, it's different proportions. So this has got almost the same amount of reach, but it's a more, it's a more nimble and quick sword, although it's not as nimble and quick, obviously, as a long sword. Um, but this weighs four pounds, eight ounces, which is just over 2,000 grams. So it's 2,065 grams. So actually, for its size, and bearing in mind that your hands are further apart, so you've got greater leverage, this is actually not bad at all, and bear in mind it's a battlefield weapon, so you're comparing that mass with things like halberds and bills, which usually weigh um, over five pounds, usually they're six, seven, eight pounds as well. They're a similar kind of mass. So I mentioned um, bearing swords, just to come back. So whilst it's true that two-handed swords or great swords um, do start to become more popular in the latter half of the 15th century and become certainly more popular in the 16th century, we do see very large two-handed swords in the 14th century, in the 1300s. And there's uh, one of these, if you want to see one, is in Arundel Castle, which is a 14th century example, probably dates to about, this is my dating of it, about maybe 1350, 1360, 1370-ish. Uh, could even be 1340-ish, but that kind of middle of the 14th century. So it's around the time of uh, Edward III and the Black Prince. So. This sword is literally a long sword of the time, uh, probably a Type 13 maybe. Um, uh, Oakshot's typologies are <laughs> somewhat open to interpretation, but probably I would say a Type 13. And it's just a big, a big version of it. And it's about the same size as this um, in terms of length, okay? Now, they are, for the most part, and there's one in Westminster Abbey as well, for the most part, it is considered that those are bearing swords, that is, they're held in front of a procession as it goes along in church and this kind of stuff, rather than fighting swords. The reason we think that is because they are massive in proportion. They're not just simply longer, but they are very heavy and all of the hilt parts are scaled up. They're just, they're just like, a, like it was made for a giant, basically. And it doesn't really seem like they're practical to use, and they are very clunky and very heavy. Um, but again, interpretation of medieval artifacts is always, uh, always difficult, and archaeologists always like to say that something is uh, for ceremonial or <laughs> ritual purpose. As an ex-archaeologist, I can uh, verify that. But um, I would say, with you know, my my own personal uh, opinion is yes, they are bearing swords because they just don't seem to be very practical fighting weapons. They are very heavy and very uh, kind of clunky. They're not just simply big long swords. Um, anyway, um, so, so coming back to conclude, two-handed swords are kind of their own thing. They're not just simply big long swords and you can't just simply use them like a big long sword, although there are some techniques that do directly translate and there are some techniques which tr can translate with a little bit of adaptation. But if we look at the treatises, the um, Iberian, the Italian and the German treatises which deal with the use of big two-handed swords, we do indeed find that they are treated as their own thing and they have their own particular ways of use. And it must be said that they are considered pretty much as battlefield weapons and very often fighting multiple opponent weapons as well. Not always, you know, you've got like Degrassi telling you uh, to use it um, differently if you're fighting one opponent, presumably with a rapier um, or spear or something else, as opposed to fighting multiple opponents. And the general advice is fighting multiple opponents, you cut and you keep cutting and you change direction a lot um, and you don't thrust very much. You don't, it's not necessarily that you don't thrust at all, although Vardy does say that, um, and that, but that's earlier. We certainly see some thrusts in some of the Iberian Montante material, but the general tendency is to cut and keep cutting and keep moving around against multiple opponents and against one opponent. Um, you can use it in different ways um, that use it more like a, a long rapier, essentially. Um, and what's interesting as well is there are Chinese, obviously this is a complete departure, but there are Chinese uh, texts which talk about the use of their very large two-handed swords, which I've been looking at with the LK Chen reviews recently. And um, 
that seems to correspond similarly to that. Uh, it says, you know, one on one, you use it like a spear, basically. So there we go. Two handed saw is interesting. We'll be talking some more about some more specific specifics of these, but this is really just a basic introduction to look at the fact that they are their own thing. They are heavier. Um, and they're also super, super interesting. Um, and I'm very uh, impressed actually with this uh, windlass uh, replica. Uh, it's not 100% true to the one in the uh, Royal Armouries, but it is a nice analogue of a 15th century, particularly English style two-handed sword um, that would have been used in the Wars of the Roses and the end of the Hundred Years' War. Anyway, thank you for watching. Give us a like and a subscribe and I'll see you soon for another video. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.